All right, thank you very much, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Joe Wynn, and my story is a little different from everyone else's because it sounds like everyone is just about to launch into their Fulbright, whereas I'm on the tail end of mine. Uh, this is the last two weeks of my stay here in Chile. I've been here for the past three and a half months working on Rapa Nui, also known as Easter Island. And what I want to do is, is provide a little bit of context first and provide you all with uh, some background on the project before I, I uh, explain what I did on my summer vacation. Uh, so first, this is an artist concept here of what Rapa Nui was believed to have looked like prior to the arrival of the uh, ancient Polynesians. And uh, what we know about Rapa Nui is that it was once a palm-dominated scrub forest. There were some larger trees as well, but primarily palms. And if you think about the, the degree of isolation of Rapa Nui, about 2,500 miles from Chile, about 2,100 miles from the Pitcairn Islands, the plants and animals that were able to arrive and successfully colonize Rapa Nui were essentially winning the dispersal lottery. And as a result of that, these, these plants and animals and the ecosystem at large was incredibly sensitive to environmental perturbations, and not to mention human activities. This is what Rapa Nui looks like today. It is obviously tremendously different from that once palm-dominated scrub forest. Um, today, all terrestrial vertebrates have gone extinct, and there are about 45 uh, plant species that are indeed endemic to the island. And what we know about the arthropods is that there are about 400 arthropod species. 95% of those are non-native invasive species, so they're not supposed to be there. They've been introduced by various mechanisms, uh, travelers, and in particular cargo ships coming and going over the past couple of hundred years. And, uh, but as a result of, there, there are 95% non-native invasive species, but of those, roughly about 5% were endemic. And that, prior to the work that I conducted in 2008 and 2000, through 2011, they were, uh, there was 21 species, and we managed to increase that number. This is the results of the work that we did in 2008 through 2011. We, during this work, we focused primarily on uh, caves, and we identified 60 cave dwelling species. Not surprisingly, there were mostly non-native in, uh, invasive insect species. However, we did identify 10 new, uh, 10 endemic cave-restricted species, eight of those were, in fact, new to science. And one thing that I learned, or observed, rather, when I uh, first arrived on Rapa Nui, my very first cave that I went into, I saw this, this fern and moss gardens. And I had been working in El Malpais National Monument for about three or four years prior to that, and they had these moss gardens. And these moss gardens were identified as being relic habitats from the Pleistocene, and there were actually insects that were living in there that were believed to be Pleistocene relics. So when I stepped into my very first cave in Rapa Nui, I saw this, and I was like, ah. Well, I didn't have a beard to tug on, but I didn't think. I was like, my goodness, I wonder if this is going to be an important habitat. These ferns are endemic, and of uh, the, about the seven different moss species, there were uh, one or two endemic moss species that also occurred within here. Lo and behold, they did prove to be very important. Uh, primarily, the in endemic insects were de detected within these fern and moss garden habitats, within the entrances, and below these uh, these uh, cinco, or these uh, uh, skylight features, these collapse features. Eight of the animals were identified as being animal uh, island endemics. Two of them were identified as being Polynesian endemics, meaning that they occurred on Rapa Nui, but also a small number of other Polynesian islands. And one thing that I want to really emphasize here is that none of them are cave adapted. Typically, when we talk about this notion of cave restriction, what <coughs> typically goes hand in hand with that is that they are adapted to the cave environment. That's not the case with these animals. These are some examples, just a few from uh, of the island endemics. What I want to emphasize here is for all of these island endemics, we, we had the luxury of being able to name these. All these animals were named either after uh, elders of the Rapa Nui community or using Rapa Nui phrases. 
This one, for example, is named after my good friend Sergio Rapu, who was the first native Rapa Nui governor of the island. And he was instrumental in this work from the beginning, and he's been a very dear friend of mine ever since. This is a species of book louse, um, which, uh, or bark louse. And this one was named is Cyptophania pacaratii, which was named after my very good friend, Lacerdo Pacarati, who is actually the caveman of Rapa Nui. He and his daughter, from a very young age, ever since she was old enough to walk, he was dragging her through caves, and they started documenting caves. And to date, they've documented over 800 caves on the island. GPS coordinates, they were, document, they were <laughs> recording the information about <laughs> what artifacts occurred within the caves. So uh, he was really instrumental in the, these, this earlier work, as well as the work that uh, I just completed. This is an example of a, uh, endemic island, uh, an island endemic that is, has a Rapa Nui phrase name. This is a species of Kalimbala. And what Kalimbala are is they're very small soil-dwelling animals. And they have what is called the spercula. And when they're alive, it's, it's basically folded into their body. And whenever they're disturbed, it springs out. Hence the common name springtail for this animal. But it is named Manu Hoko. And kind of within uh, that spirit, Manu is Rapa Nui for animal. And Hoko is this ancient Rapa Nui dance where the men would jump up and down like this. So, you know, we found it very befitting to name a jumping animal Manu Hoko. The other one is Pseudocinella haha uteana, and haha uteana is Rapa Nui for mouth of the cave. And this was an idea that, that I, I was uh, really keen on. This was a paper that we published back in 2014 um, in the journal Bioscience, and it's discussing the canoe bug hypothesis. And what this is, we had two animals, as I mentioned earlier, that were Polynesian endemics, and they occurred on Rapa Nui and also a small number of other Polynesian islands, but we walked through the possibilities from dispersal, and there were three primary possibilities, and we were able to largely rule out, well, we were able to rule out two of them, kind of were able to rule out the third, and put forward this idea, that the ancient Polynesians were responsible for moving bugs from island to island as they colonized wet from west to east across the South Pacific. Because what we know about the Polynesians is that when they traveled, much like you know the, the U.S. folks here, would, when we car camp, we take the things that we want to have with us on our little adventure. Well, the Polynesians were no different. They took plants that they wanted to have with them when they arrived at the next island. And they were also forward thinking in that they would plant these plants knowing that, hey, if we ever come back here, we'll have the medicine that we want, or we'll have the plants that we need for making nets, or for uh, making or for getting some or for uh, food. And that's what they did. They put the plants in these gourds, they would put them in these large voyaging canoes, and oftentimes within those gourds would be soil. And there was no sag, there was no Department of Agriculture that was screening the soil to make sure there were no bugs in it. And lo and behold, what would happen is they would be dispersed from island to island. That was our idea. We put it forward as a hypothesis. This is one of those springtails, Lepidocitrus oleana, which was previously known from the Hawaiian Islands only, later turned up on Rapa Nui. Our next one is Stylonaceus manuvaca, and we're dubbing it the canoe bug because we identified it from Rapa Iti in French Polynesia and in Rapa Nui. And we were able to, we described this animal because serendipity prevailed and uh, specimens arrived at my dear friend Stefano Teati's doorstep about the same time, and we named it Manu Vaca, which is Rapa Nui for canoe animal. So moving right along here, this is the work that we just completed, uh, and I say we because I'm, I'm standing up here by myself, but my goodness, there was well over 50 people that contributed to the success of this project. Uh, my university, <coughs> CONAF, which is the uh, which is responsible for managing parks and forests uh, throughout Chile, the uh, museum on Rapa Nui, uh, the University of Chile, the uni uh, uh, UNCE, Consejo de Monumentos, and of course, the Fulbright Commission. Thank you all so much for this wonderful opportunity. So the objectives of this work was to inventory and ultimately describe endemic insects in various areas on Rapa Nui. And what we decided was that the best areas to look were those areas that were least likely 
to be impacted by human activities, livestock, and even rats. And then we also looked within those areas that contained native plants. And as it turned out, the areas that we targeted were caves, cliffs, coasts, and crater lakes. And these are our summary of our study sites. We did a heck of a lot of work during this project. We sampled 20 caves, 10 cliff faces, three crater lakes, eight rocky coasts, two beaches, and we had four surface grids that we scattered across the island that we were using for control. So if we wanted to say, you know, these, this particular insect is only from cliffs, well, we kind of need something to hang our hat on, and, and these control sites were going to help us do that. This is a summary. Uh, this is our map of the different areas. In red, we have caves. In orange are the rocky coasts. Blue are the two primary beaches. Uh, in purple, we have the different cliffs that we sampled. In uh, turquoise are the three crater lakes. And then, of course, we have our three surface grids that uh, are in green hollowed out squares. And because I do a lot of GIS work, I do want to emphasize none of this is the scale. So the cave is not that doggone big on the, uh, on the map, neither are those grids. So these are the results. And actually, uh, to digress just ever so slightly, this is one of my favorite pictures that I've taken to date. Uh, this is a kalimbola, and this thing is that big, incredibly tiny. And he or she and I had a connection because this animal looked at me as I was taking the photograph. You can see the live looking right at me, so it was pretty rad. Uh, so thus far, once again, these results are preliminary. I cannot emphasize that enough. We've identified 33 uh, animals thus far, two species, family, genus level. We believe, based on consultations with various taxonomic uh, experts that I'm working with, that we probably have about 10 new uh, or potentially endemic species to add to our list. And all of the habitats that we went to appear to be important to endemic insects. What we have is we, we found you know one or two of these endemic insects so far in these different habitats. And I also want to further emphasize that Rapa Nui has been an area that has been continuously used by humans for several hundred years, and those impacts are continuing and they're being accelerated. When I, my first trip there, or my last trip there was in 2011, I revisited in 2016, and my goodness, there has been so much change. So much change. I, I, was, I was floored. I was like, wow, this is not the Rapa Nui that I just, that I went to in 2011. So within that very brief span, there was just this rapid change in, in, in building, and in the cars that they're driving, and now everyone wants these big monster trucks, and the roads are not designed for big monster trucks, and so it's, these impacts are accelerating. So this is something that, that I've emphasized when working with the Rapa Nui community, that these are things that we really need to be thinking about. If we want to protect the remaining endemic animals on the island, we really need to start thinking now while these, chain, these big changes are in play. So here's uh, some of our potentially new species. This is a potential new species of uh, Stylonosity. This is uh, an, an isopod, and uh, this is really cool. I really like this Ahupahu, which is Rapa Nui for this guy, an isopod. This is another uh, potentially new species of Anthropiidae. This is, uh, and when, when I'm giving lectures, I've been giving a lot of lectures while here. Uh, I always like to share this with the. With the, uh, with the students and also, you know, we're all students, right? Because we're all continuously learning. With this particular family of beetles, the males have the typically, they're, they're, this uh, group is essentially dimorphic. The males will have typically longer antenna. The females will have shorter antenna. So we have a male here. And from cliffs, we have uh, uh, so a couple of potentially new, or one that we've identified so far. Uh, this is a grass, a, an endemic grass, it's a uh, hiku o kioye, and in this particular grass we found this, this is called a plant hopper, and it was, a, it was very close to the roots, and uh, this is typically one of the habitats that these, these animals will carve out as, as their very own, and uh, we have actually two different species, I'm only showing one here, I'm kind of jumping forward, but uh, we have another one that we believe to be new from coasts as well, but I don't have it photograph of that one. 
in craters. We have this guy, and this is a pretty cool discovery. Uh, I'm working on a paper right now with several Chilean colleagues on the spiders of Rapa Nui revisited, we're just about to submit. And um, in walking through that process, we, uh, my colleague collected these in Ron Muraku. Well, I went to all the crater lakes and I found it only in Ron Muraku. And I, and I told my buddy Darko, I was like, I think that this is a new species because you know, your, your former advisor, Berkeley, is, is saying that it's not known within the South Pacific. It doesn't match anything in Chile. And it's only found in these reeds within, within this one crater. Why am I not able to read it? Ah, okay. Well, for whatever reason. Anyhow, in these, Totoro is the name of this reed. And they were only found within the reeds in Ronald Morocco. This is Ronald Cow. And we found uh, this beetle as well. So we believe that these are some other new species. Turning our attention to beaches. We have an, a, new, a potentially new species of amphipod. In consultation with a colleague of mine, Jim Lowry, he suggested or he indicated that there was no previous work done on this group on Rapa Nui. These animals do not travel well, meaning not that they can go from town to town because they enjoy it, and meaning that you cannot put them accidentally in your luggage. They cannot be put with seawater and accidentally uh, moved from one place to another. They don't move. They don't disperse well in that regard. So most likely this is going to be a new endemic species as well. And it's not orange, much like when you put shrimp in hot water, they turn orange. You put these guys in alcohol and they turn orange. We have another new, potentially new species of haku haku from the Rocky Coast <coughs> as well. And this one was really neat for me because in 2009 we went to, we collected two immatures of this species of cricket. And when I was, when I was discussing this, I'd sent these specimens to my friend and colleague, Daniel Lott, and he told me, well, it could be new, but we need adults. And through this work we've collected my goodness, I think we collected uh, well over 20 to 30 adults. So we now have enough material to formally identify and potentially describe this animal if it does prove to be new. So we're going to use two different lenses in terms of conservation and management here. Um, and it's uh, looking at it from the Cape specific scale and looking at it from the island wide scale. The reason we're doing this is we know right now a lot more about what's going on cave wise than we do island-wide because, as I mentioned earlier, these results are preliminary. <coughs> so, concerning the future of Rapa Nui cave endemic species, in the paper that we published in 2014, I, we suggested that all of them are believed to be imperiled, and this is the reason. <coughs> Looking at extinction deaths, this is an e ecological term, and basically what this suggests is that populations can can basically oscillate over generation time close to an extinction threshold before ultimately going extinct. Well, for half of those endemics that we detected, we detected them in numbers of two or fewer. And we conducted this fairly wide-scale effort in this one particular area on the island, which suggested to us that, okay, well, these species may indeed be in trouble. Also, alien species, 95% of the insects on Rapa Nui have been identified as being not native. These two species, uh, Periplaneta americana and Oxidus grassalis. Periplaneta, Periplaneta americana is the American cockroach. Oxidus grassalis is a common, very common now, uh, garden millipede. And they've been identified as threatening the persistence of cave adapted insects in Hawaii. Those were the second and third most abundant insects detected during the, the cave work from 20, 2008 to 2011. So there's the possibility that these guys are competing with those endemics and potentially preying upon some of those endemics as well. And then also climate change. Uh, precipitation in the warmer subtropical regions has been identified to, uh, uh, to there's going to be a decrease in precipitation in those regions and Rapa Nui is considered subtropical. So based on this IPCC report that was published in 2010, that is likely to occur on Rapa Nui. 
And concerning uh, conservation and management, there is a silver lining to the story with caves. <coughs> One third of the known endemics prior to this work that we just completed are believed to be restricted to caves. So if we can close caves, and I've, I've, I've been preaching about this my entire time on Rapa Nui, that we need to close the caves until we can estimate the distributions of these endemic insects and at least get some sort of baseline understanding concerning the populations. And they, they seem to be warming up to that idea. Also, this is a very low-tech approach that is highly effective. We can rope this off. Rope off the fern moss gardens, put signs at the trailhead saying, you know, this habitat has been identified as being very sensitive, it's an endemic habitat, and it con contains endemic insects. Please don't walk in this area. Because right now, folks, when they enter caves, they walk really willy through the caves. So that's not a good thing for conservation and management. And finally, this is something that I did have an opportunity of discussing with uh, the two schools at Rapa Nui, is this idea of a captive breeding program. These are tiny insects. And once again, low tech. Get a 10 gallon tank, put some soil, start rearing the, the ferns and moss, and then put the insects in there and start a captive breeding program. And then this would be a great opportunity for students to learn about ecology. And also, once they felt that the populations, you know, once they had a large number of, for example, these columbia, they can have a field trip and go out and put them in caves. And that's something that can be done, at least in the short term, to help ensure the, the persistence of these animals. Looking at island-wide conservation and management, once again, uh, the results are preliminary. Uh, we do believe right now that we have potentially doubled the number of endemics known to occur on the island from 10 to 20. Uh, I did mention earlier that there were, there were uh, 21 endemics known prior to my 2008 through 2011 work, but none of those animals have been identified since their initial description. So we believe all of them to be uh, uh, probably extinct, or they occur in such low numbers as to have been able to evade detection. So what we're, relying, what we're suggesting now is that we're looking at uh, 10 from the cave work and possibly an additional 10 from this work. What, we are, what I am suggesting is that native insects are obviously competing with the non-native insects. And we know that the non-native insects have clearly swamped the number of endemics. And native plants are also competing with non-native plants. There are about 45 native plants uh, that are extant on Rapa Nui right now. And what I've suggested based on this work and what this work is, what the evidence is telling me preliminarily is that we need to pr promote native plant habitat so we can promote the persistence of native insects. Without native plants, we're going to dramatically impact habitat availability for the native insects. So regarding outreach and popular press, uh, like I said, I'm on the tail end of, of this journey. Um, we had a piece that ran in Discover Magazine back in uh, July. Uh, I did a, a colleagues and I, it was beautifully put together piece by Parque Nacional Rapa Nui on the work, it ran on uh, Mata Atu TV in Rapa Nui, and it's also on my YouTube channel, and I also have it if, if, if I can give a copy to, to Fulbright as well. Uh, it beautifully summarizes the work. Uh, we did two radio interviews, me and Park, uh, a very close Park Art friend of mine, and I did two radio interviews. I also, uh, with, uh, actually all of us were interviewed by Technica Sciencia, which is channel 13 here in Santiago. And uh, it's a weekly or monthly program. I'm not sure exactly how it runs, but that's going to be coming out within the next uh, couple of months. So some of you will be here, so you might be able to see it. Uh, tell me how it comes out, please. Um, <laughs> and then concerning uh, educational outreach, I was at, uh, spoke at two secondary schools in Rapa Nui. I um, also gave two talks at the National Park regarding this work. Gave two talks at Consejo de Monumentos. Uh, and then I just gave a talk yesterday at the University of Chile. Uh, I have a talk tomorrow at Museo Nacional Historia Natural uh, here in the center about this work. And uh, then I have a workshop that I'm coordinating with colleagues uh, next week on biodiversity, in particular uh, biological diversity of insects in Chile. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm not a one-man band. Uh, there were so many folks uh, they contributed to this, and the work would not have been possible without the support of the Rapa Nui community and Parque Nacional Rapa Nui. Uh, and 
and Conservative and Monumentos and the museum. We were able to, uh, through the museum, they, they uh, provided us with lab space for us to work while we were there. So uh, this was, this was a, a huge island-wide effort and uh, it was, would not have been successful without all these folks. We also had sponsors. The old Cordage gave us, uh, golly, uh, what was it? Uh, something like 5,000 feet of rope. Um, yes, and it was quite fun lugging it down around every day. Uh, Rock Exotica Act Safe, Rip Core Travel Protection. Uh, shameless plug for these guys. These guys are great. If you're in a hairy situation and you want a safety net, we were, we were checking in daily with these folks. And as soon as I would send, I have a daily expedition uh, a plan that I send out to the National Park and to these guys. Within five minutes, they got back to me. Plan received, let us know when to get back. And uh, so they were a highly effective safety net. And I was very fortunate to be working with them. And then these also, uh, these other companies sponsored our work. Here's my contact information. And Marua, which is Rapa Nui, thank you all very much.